My name is Brittany Hedrick and today is Thursday, June 28th, 2018. I am at the house of Jim Swiggett um, to conduct an oral history interview for the UNCG Institutional Memory Collection. Thank you, Jim, and also Tom Martin is here with us. Thank you so much for um, sharing your experiences with me and participating in this project. Um, now, Jim, I'd like to start the interview off by um, asking you about your childhood. Could you tell me when and where you were born? I was born in Trinity, 1930. Trinity, North Carolina? Trinity, North Carolina. In 1930, it's okay. It's part of Archdale now, I think. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, what did your parents do? My mother was a housewife. She worked at a certain jobs, odd jobs in part of her life, and my father was a farmer. Okay. And we, he grew a lot of vegetables, and uh, but we basically were farmers. I've hoed a lot of corn and <laughs> bailed a lot of hay and one thing and another in my lifetime. Did you have any siblings? I had one brother and one sister. My sister is two years younger, my brother is seven years younger. So, um, where did you go to high school when you were growing up? I went to Trinity High School. Okay. Did you enjoy school? Yes, I did. What were your favorite subjects? I'm not sure what my favorite subject was, but I, uh, I was not a good math student. But I guess I enjoyed history as much as anything. Me too. Did you play any sports? I did. I played football, basketball, and baseball. <coughs> and I enjoyed all of them. We had started out with a six-man football team. Later we added a, other men and we had an 11-man football team. Our high school coach was Millard Coble, who had just gotten out of service when he started the athletic programs at Trinity High School. At that, at, at that time, we had very little of an athletic program until the, our coach got out of the service. Hmm. So is there one sport that you were better at than another? Probably baseball. Baseball, okay. So that was your favorite, probably. Well, maybe. I love basketball. <laughs> yeah, okay. I put up a basketball goal at home, or had my dad put up a basketball goal at home, and my sister and I, and my brother and I, were all very active on that outdoor basketball goal. Hmm. My sister later became an all-state basketball player. Wow. Okay. Well, um, so what did you do after high school? Did you go to college? Yes, I uh, entered High Point College in 19... 48, graduated in 1952, took my first teaching and coaching job at Seagrove High School in Randolph County in 1952. Okay. Now, while in college, I'd, what was your major? Physical education. Okay. okay. I taught at Seagrove High School for three years. Then I went to Allen J. High School and taught there for 11 years. Okay. And then I spent the next 22 at UNCG. Okay. And you taught um, physical education at Seagrove and Allen J.? I taught physical education. I also taught some history and some civics. Oh, okay. And Very I cool. even tried to teach biology at one of the schools. <laughs> okay. How did that go? Well, it was tar very difficult for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you did fine. Yes. Well, um, okay, so d is there any memories or um, anything particular you want to mention about your time at, um, at Seagrove or Allen J? Uh, not particularly, it was just a everyday occurrence. I, I was driving from High Point or from Archdale or no from where was it? Cedar Square. Cedar Ann. Square. I was driving from Cedar Square in Randolph, northern Randolph County to Seagrove every day which is about 25 miles I guess. 
And at that time, you had to drive right through the middle of Ashboro. There were no bypasses. Mm. So that was kind of hectic. Okay. You need to tell them how you had to put wood in the furnace at 5 o'clock in the morning at Seagrove. <laughs> yeah. You want to tell us about it? Well, I, I didn't like getting up that early, and I didn't like to have to drive that far, but that was necessary. It was hard finding jobs at that time. And I was the first, last person hired, I think, at Seagrove High School that year. And so you had to go put wood in the fireplace, in the furnace? No, we had, in the gym, we had a wood-burning stove at each end to keep it warm. And you had to stoke, stoke that stir, stove every morning of a basketball game in order to get it warm enough at night. Wow. Things are surely different now, aren't <laughs> they? Little, yes, they are. <laughs> are you glad that they're different now? <laughs> I think so. I haven't experienced... Uh, well, I have experienced a lot of different gymnasiums. I enjoyed the old time gymnasium at Seagrove, but it had a wooden floor, and the, uh, Alan Jay had an old uh, rock gym with a wooden floor. And uh, so I enjoyed all my coaching career. And that rock gym's still there, isn't it? Yes, it is. I was it is it was. quite a. It's, a, it's almost a historic landmark. I think it probably is today, isn't probably it? Probably is. Yeah. If it's not, it should be. You're, you're right, it should be if it isn't. And so, Tom, when did you first uh, meet Jim? Well, I met Jim. I didn't like the experience that well, but I met Jim when we played. I went to Curry High School, and we had the, one of the best teams in the state, what was called a 1A team. And we did not lose a single game to a school our size all year until the semifinals of the state tournament, except for my buddy Jim. He took <laughs> us over. You talk about the woodshed. He took us over to that rock gym, and he beat the tar out of us. He, he learned how to stop my hook shot and, <laughs> and our guards penetrating drive. And so that's when that was my first experience with him. And I... Almost never. I, I think I've forgiven him now. That's been about 60 years ago. So. <laughs> okay. So I know that Jim ended up at UNCG, so you knew him before that. I did. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, um, Jim, why don't you tell us about what brought you to UNCG? What was that journey like? Well, I was um, taught at Seagrove for three years, and I taught at Allen J for 11 years, and I decided while I was at Allen J that I would go back to graduate school. And I applied to UNCG, the Health, Physical Education and Recreation Department for an assistantship. And I was granted an assistantship, but I wasn't told anything about it. So when I walked into the Coleman gym to find out what my duties were going to be, my responsibilities as a graduate assistant, I was told that I was going to begin a men's basketball program. Wow. And what year was this? 66. When was it then? 1966. The year 1966, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so what were your first impressions of the campus? And Well, I had been visited the campus at UNCG and I knew a lot about it. And, but I was delighted at the reception that I got from the faculty at UNCG's HPRD. They were good people. It had been a woman's college, you know, a UNC, a woman's college. And the faculty at UNCG at that time consisted of one male faculty member of HPERD. I think it was one or maybe two, and the rest were ladies. Hmm. But they gave us a warm welcome, and we survived and thrived. <laughs>
What, what was y'all's offices then? What? What was your offices then? What it down in the basement? The, Our, my office and offices, uh, Frank, Frank Pleasance was the first man hired. He was a basketball player from Catawba College and a graduate of uh, Florida, one of the Florida universities, Florida State, I believe. And he was the <coughs> first man hired and he was the uh, athletic director, coordinator for the male faculty and students and he was the first male faculty at HPNRD. So uh, our offices were in the uh, a complex that included the uh, Rosenthal Gymnasium and Rosenthal Pool. And That's we right. were in the basement or bottom level of Rosenthal Gym. You know, they just they just closed down that pool. They just removed that swimming pool you're talking about. Did they really? They did. Yes. When they uh, closed down Rosenthal Gym, I went to our coordinator of health, physical education, and recreation, and asked him if he was going to sell any of the physical education equipment or if the university were going to sell any physical education equipment. And he said, well, it would probably go out for bids. But it didn't, they just let it go and it went to the contractor. So I went to the contractor and asked him if I could buy some of the physical education equipment. He said, you can have anything you want. So I have one piece of the marble showers left that the women had marble showers at women's college and i have i took several pieces of the marble <clears throat> and brought them home with me and i have one piece left out here and i have several pieces of physical education equipment that were in old rosenthal gym yeah. and i'm really delighted to have them i've got the ladder that i used to do my D raises and workouts on, and uh, it's in the basement here. And uh, I've tried to salvage everything I could out of that old gymnasium because it would have all been gone if I hadn't salvaged a few pieces. Yeah. yeah. That's right. So um, I just want to clarify you so you were a student. And for your assistantship, they asked you to coach the first um, men's basketball team, correct? Yeah, I was a graduate student. Yes. But I think I had graduated when they asked me. To, okay. I, I can't remember, but part of my graduate duties was to coach the men's basketball, start a men's basketball program. Okay. And I think... Uh, somehow managed to find about all the students that had played high school basketball that were students at UNCG, Tom being one of them, and Boyd Edwards was another one, and... Uh, Brian Emerson, Brian uh, Emerson. Brian Emerson, and there were some others that I can't remember now, but yeah. every player, Charlie Cole for one. Right, Charlie Cole. Every player on that first basketball team was a student at UNCG when I was uh, hired. And and we all played against either, they all were played, we played against each other in high school. We knew all of our teammates, we used to yeah. be rivals. And that's what, because everybody lived within the same county or adjoining counties. All the men's players did. Correct. So. Mm. And we had a pretty good program and a pretty good basketball team, didn't we, Tom? Yeah, we just couldn't win. We did everything but win. So Yeah. And we had the the neat thing, and I don't know if you remember this or not, but we had all five of our starters averaged in double figures. Now, we averaged 12, 13 to 14 points a game, but we all averaged in double figures. So any night, any given night, somebody would be the leading scorer and scores 20 points and the other people would fall back. But... But that was unusual in this day and age to have everybody averaging double figures. I'll tell you an interesting uh, happening. 
the night of our first basketball, home basketball game, we were playing Methodist College. And Methodist College came to UNCG to eat in the dining hall prior to the game. And when they walked into the dining hall, the women in the dining hall, mostly co-eds, mostly young women, stand up and gave them an outstanding ovation. Did you know that, Tom? I did know that. I did. I'm still pissed off about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> kind of kind of tough when your opponents up there, the girls are cheering for the guys that you're going to be playing against in a few minutes. So. Yeah. I, that's one of many stories I remember, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think they did that? I think it's because, you know, there's, there weren't that many men on campus, and mm -hmm. so it was just a yeah, fact of was, having... They were so delighted to have a men on campus for the first reason and to have a, maybe a basketball program in the second exactly reason. Right. Yeah. But they all came out... To, I mean, the, the tennis at the game was tremendous. I mean, we had... I mean, it was in Coleman yeah. Gym, but it was... Pack five, six hundred people is all it could be. A standing room, it was ten deep all the way around it. So oh, every game, yeah, every home game. Okay. So whenever you uh, when you graduated, you were hired on to um, start the um, the men's basketball program. So what were some challenges that you faced um, during that time in starting up the program? Money. The Student Government Association gave us a grand total of a thousand dollars to begin a men's basketball program. I'm going to ask you if it wasn't a thousand dollars. That's what I remembered. What? That's what I remembered was a thousand dollars. Thousand dollars. That's right. That's not a lot. That didn't go very far. <laughs> okay. And I was trying to hire officials, schedule basketball games. <coughs> And it was really a hectic experience. And a lot of decisions had to be made about uniforms, about scheduling, uh, travel. It was just a very difficult time, but we muddled through it <laughs> and survived. So you were in charge of um, kind of uh, creating the uniform. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about those uniforms? Well, our head of our PE department, Ethel Martis, was quite active in that aspect. She was running actually the head of all of this. The dean of the HPNRD was Ethel Martis. And she was very interested and very active in all of this beginning of these programs. She had to okay it all, and she did. There was some opposition from some of the women professors to men being on campus even, weren't it, wasn't it, Ty? Just a little bit, yes, yeah. <laughs> some of the faculty, so. Uh, but you know, I went, to almost every department on that campus looking for help in the beginning of that program. I went to the business department to see if they would help with statistics and so forth. And every department that I visited welcomed me and was delighted that we were beginning a men's program. So the help was there from almost, I, I think, every department and area that I visited was delighted to see the men come on that campus. Well, do you, do you remember, I know that the colors of the university at that time had been kind of like gold or yellow and white because of the daisy chain, that was the colors, and then the, with the added blue, but did, I mean, didn't y'all, weren't you, keeping those two colors to basically because you thought that would be good for the folks who were on the university campus and then adding blue so you've got some contrast. I mean, it was yeah, I, nothing I magical I, about the colors, was it? It's just a matter of using what we had plus adding blue to give I, you some contrast. I believe that's correct, Tom. Yeah, it was just, that's kind of what yeah, I remember back. That's what I remember. And what about the mascot? You know, I don't remember much about 
a mascot. The mascot was a, uh, the nickname Spartans came out with, and we had to select that. And there was some, I don't guess there was any much controversy, but there was some, a lot of discussion about it. And I didn't want to get involved in it. I didn't care much about it. Yeah. We didn't have an actual mascot. We had the nickname Spartans, but yeah, there was not a, a mask, there wasn't right. a uniform, there wasn't a mascot. Uh, I know that, do you remember, I mean, I remember some of the names, they wanted us to be the UNCG co-eds, that was one of the names, or trying to think of some of the other, they, they were using some warrior type names, and I'm trying to blank on them right now, but I remember the co-eds because that was just so stupid to yeah, think. Yeah, it was pretty stupid. <laughs> and, uh, so, but, um, but, but I can't think of the other names right now. I can't right either, either, Tom. Some of the other ones that we know about were the Brigadiers. Oh yeah, Brigadiers, generals. that's one. The Generals, and yeah, we didn't do the Generals because we had the Greensboro Generals ice hockey team. Brigadiers, I don't know where the heck that came, that came from. Those were the top, those three, the, those are three I remember and I, there was a couple others that yeah, I think if, I went back, if I went back through my notes, I would, would figure it out, so. Yeah, yeah, There's a picture in that book of them choosing the new boys. Right, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. I think they ruled out, you know, just out of hand, all animals. Like right, they did, they did rule out all animals, mm -hmm. and we tried not to, they tried not to have a nick, nickname that was, had another school in the state, in this area. And, the, you know, the Spartans, it was the Spartan, with Michigan, uh, Michigan, I guess it was. Michigan State or but that's, somebody. That's yeah. the only other Spartan, so that was felt to be safe. So... Uh, Okay, so I did want to back up and, and ask you a question. Uh, you were talking about finding um, players uh, for the basketball team. How did you go about um, picking those uh, players, such as Tom? We had tryouts, workouts, like you would for any basketball team or basketball program, and I put up notices across campus. I'm sure I did that so that inviting all people to try out for the university basketball program. Did you have a really big turnout? Uh, quite a few. I, I was surprised at the number of high school players that were on our campus. I don't think there were any, I don't think I ever coached a player that would qualify in a Division One basketball player, right. which is r pretty rare. Yeah. But uh, I can't remember any. Do you, Tom? No, no there weren't any. And uh, even at Allen J or anywhere, even the high schools I was, I didn't yeah. play, ever coach any players that were good enough, s supposedly yeah. to enter a Division One basketball yeah, program. Man, I think we pretty much the first couple of years. As I recall, we pretty much played like eight players. You know, we had 12 to 15 on the team, but probably yeah. the five starters, and then we had three of, probably three that came off the bench fairly regularly. Yeah. And that's just, that's what I'm remembering. That's that, pretty, pretty much accurate, Tom. Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned having a low budget, but so what were you able to pro provide the players? gym time <laughs> <laughs> and one pair of tennis shoes we got one pair of shoes yeah we got one pair well, of shoes we, I, I fought like heck with the lady mm. faculty to provide things they had a women's basketball program but they didn't provide the women anything except the gym time and the coaching I wanted more for the men and I fought to get it, and it, eventually it turned out that we did a, were able to get some assistance. And wasn't Ethel Martis, wasn't she just a really big supporter? She really wanted the men's program to succeed, and yeah, a lot of people was, uh, would not have thought that of her, but she really stepped up for us. Yes, she did, Tom. She was a really strong advocate, and, uh, and she was a really smart lady, brother. And yeah. tough lady, too. <laughs> she was. Well, speaking of advocates, um, so who are some of the other um, 
advocates for the men's basketball team and are, are any colleagues or anybody that you can think of that really left an impression on you or um, really contributed to the UNCG men's basketball team? Well, the chemistry department, Dr. Peter Ball and, uh, <coughs> was quite a strong advocate for men's athletics. And other than that, I can't recall. I mean, I'm sure there were some others, but he stood out. Do you, do you remember? Yeah, but do you remember Dave Knight? He was in the chemistry department. He was in the too. chemistry. Dave was, Dave was real advocate because he. Yes, he was. I, I, I still remember. remember I remember Dave Knight and I. Before he died, we'd walk at the games and he'd get up and leave a game because he said our players aren't trying. He said, he said, when you played and he because he saw me play. He said when you played. Y'all weren't very good, but you left everything on the court. You you worked hard, you tried hard, yeah. and if you you may lose, but you're going to give it a, your all. He said, I can't stand to watch these guys today. They don't even try. And he'd walk out of a game. And I still, I mean, that's still, I still remember that with him. And and ch the chancellor was another big guy because the chancellor just loved us going to men's, starting a men's program. And... Uh, so I think you know that was Chancellor Ferguson then, and then Bill Moran That's later true. on. But, but Chancellor Ferguson, I still remember the photograph of him in the Carolinian with him sitting there. Just I mean, you'd think. <laughs> I believe that's in the yearbook. Maybe. Yeah, it is. It is. So. Do you have any um, special memories of the Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Ferguson, or Chancellor Moran that you'd like to mention? Anything that comes to mind? They were. Good advocates, but I don't remember having to deal with them at all. Okay. Uh, they were in favor of the program, and that was all I needed. <laughs> it's all you need to know, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the particulars about the basketball team. Um, how did you guys travel to away games and, um, you know, Maybe like, where did you eat? Where did you stay? Well, we most of our schedule was, uh, I would say, local. It may not be local, but we traveled within North Carolina. And the only place we went out of town, we went out of North Carolina. We went to Lynchburg, Virginia, and we went to Charleston, South Carolina. Good memory. That's exactly right. Eastern Mennonite did that. Was that is that in Charles? Was that in Virginia? We, we played Mennonite, the Amish. We played them, and we played uh, Lynchburg. Lynchburg, okay, yeah. Didn't you play James Madison? Play who? James Madison. Not early on. Not early on. I don't know. I don't remember that. May have. But you remember the you remember the buses we had to use? We used. Uh, we chartered buses to begin with, which we drove, went in style. We didn't have the money, but the university paid for us to charter buses, and I really enjoyed the travel in a chartered bus. And that didn't last very long. Yeah, I, I don't remember. remember. Do I remember don't remember that time? No, I remember, <laughs> I remember <laughs> rickety old buses, but that may, have been, that may have been after I left. You got, you got better really? after I left. Maybe it was, but I know but I, we, I, we had we were able to charter buses yeah. at one time. And I think travel. we had charter bus going to Char we went to Charleston because that was so far. But like the yeah. St. Andrews and um, we drove vans to the, some yeah. of the places. Yeah, we deal. drove university vans quite a bit of the time. And I didn't like driving that. I, I had trouble. I had some problems with keep staying awake, and I had I didn't like driving those vans. Yeah. Oh, so they had you drive? I said they'd had, they had. I, I didn't want to drive, but I had to. And I, I had trouble know. staying awake, but yeah. I managed. Well, how did you keep all those boys in line while you were driving? We were sleeping. <laughs> oh, okay. We were resting. Yeah, the they, I mean, a basketball team or most any team travels. Most of the players sleep. Yeah. <laughs> so they don't get rambunctious in the back. <laughs> If they did, they I didn't ever I don't ever I, remember. I'm them. sure they, I did not. I'm sure I did not. These these kids were university people now. They weren't high school kids anymore, and they respected 
program and they respected each other and they, I didn't have any problem with discipline whatsoever. Yeah. And, and we just and we just wanted to play basketball again. That's we, right. We went to college not thinking we'd ever play basketball again and here we, you know, Jim being the coach, we got a chance to, to lace it up again and, and have fun. That was it. Are there any stories that come to mind for either one of you about um, well, any particular players that left an impression on you and any maybe fun stories that you remember, anything you'd like to share with us? Well, when we went to Ch College of Charleston to play the first basketball game down there, we had one black basketball player on our team and that was Charlie Cole. And when we went to play the College of Charleston, we walked into the gym. There was one other black face in there, and that was the janitor. That's true. And when Charlie Cole ran out on the basketball floor at the beginning of their warm-ups, you could hear a pin drop because he was the only black player, the only black person in that gym. Yeah. You remember that? Time? I do. I like it was yesterday. I remember that, and I remember. It's Staying, remember the we used to stay in the when we played St. Andrews in that tournament beginning of the yeah. season. We stayed in a upstairs, they had a kind of dormitory space, and that's where you stayed because you didn't have any money to try for hotels. So we'd stay there and we'd eat on campus, we'd eat, didn't it? Night, but then we eat in their school cafeteria too, and yeah, and spent the night up there. And, yes, uh, uh, and I remember that, and I still remember we played Greensboro College. We led the whole game, and they took the lead for the first time with two seconds to go. And we lost that game, and that seemed to be our modus operandi that year. We'd play really good basketball, it'd be close, and we'd find a way to lose at the end. I'd foul out, or I'd miss a foul shot, or so it wasn't the coaches doing, it was the players didn't perform right. So. It could have been the coaches, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I got to ask uh, either one of you about the first game at St. Andrews, did I? I don't think no, I... No, you didn't. Uh, you didn't. That's just, I, I mentioned you asked about memories, and that, that's yeah, one, yeah. that was one that just comes to mind. Yeah. Was, did you want to talk about that first game or, or the atmosphere? You talking about the first home game or the no, first, the first, the first away game? game. Was, the first travel game when we went to St. Andrews and played in the beginning of the year tournament. Oh yeah, I we, had forgotten that. We played Greensboro College and I think we played St. Andrews with the other team, I think. Yeah, I had forgotten that, Tom. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you remember a lot more than I do. I just have to remember that. So. Well, <clears throat> as a player, what was it like uh, playing uh, for UNCG at an away game? Um, what, what was that experience like when you first walked out on the court? Well, that was, I mean, it was cool. That was the, actually, that was the furthest away from Greensboro I'd ever played in high school or college, either one. So, you didn't I mean, travel like that. Yeah, yeah, we didn't travel back in those days. High school, you didn't travel. College, you didn't travel that much. And uh, uh, it just, you know, the atmosphere was electric because it was opening season. You know, and everybody, you know, they didn't know what to expect from us. And so that's why we, we kind of snuck up on Greensboro College and, and completely controlled the game until the end. And then we just couldn't, as they say, you couldn't throw it in the ocean from five feet, as the saying goes. So, uh, I mean, that's, uh, I, you know, it's amazing the little things you remember. I remember that. I remember playing, we played at UNC Charlotte the first year they ever had a basketball program. They just had the college. And we played in a junior high school that the shower heads were like four feet off the ground and here we are these six foot six guys having to literally get on your knees to take a shower I mean I remember that I remember playing at Eastern Mennonite and and having the referees call every player on the other team by first name and they're telling us you boys ain't never played here before have you and we knew then that it was going to be an ugly an ugly game because we were not going to have any breaks at all I mean just little tidbits like that and uh and I remember fouling out of the first home game, which the first home game was probably more memorable 
I don't know about you, but well, no, it was well, more memorable very, because very it's, memorable it's, it's at home. It was exciting. You know, the atmosphere was just electric. Yeah, it was. Um, and except for the dining room where they cheered the <laughs> other team, it was the atmosphere was electric. That so. really had nothing to do with the game. <laughs> it did. I, I, trust me, they were a lot better than we were. You're yeah. right. So. Sure. What do you do on that? They had a pond, Swiggett's Pond. Huh? It was open to the public, and it was the only facility around. It was just an old pond. People came from miles around. It was the only place to swim. And that's uh, they grew up doing that. They ran a concession stand, and they had people swam in the summertime, and every church came and had baptizings. It was the place. Oh, wow. So that was a big part of it. That's the reason none of them can hear, swimming in the <laughs> Swimming in that dirty did, water. Oh, okay. Did you ever do anything with Piney Lake? Because Piney Lake is back well, over. I didn't do anything with Piney okay. Lake. I don't. I, I remember Piney Lake, and I remember it being a very uh, <coughs> popular place for the students to go. But uh, I did. I wasn't involved with Piney Lake, so I, I didn't have uh, very many memories of it. Okay. I don't have anything else in my notes. Okay. So you're good. All right. I will tell you one interesting story about this basketball program. When I quit coaching the men's basketball program, I started doing some other activities. And I, one of the activities that I taught, or that supposedly taught, was skiing. But we didn't teach it. We organized it and took the skiers to Appalachian Ski Mountain and the Appalachian ski instructors taught the skiers to ski for a week up in the mountains. Well, when I was in this, this ski group, I was one of the uh, ad, well, one of the organizers of the ski trip. And one day I got a call while I was at the ski trip. Said so Jim, our basketball coach has either quit or been fired. I've forgotten what it was, and I can't remember who she was. Do you remember? I Tom? do not remember. No. But she said Dr. McGee was in charge of the faculty at that time. She was, and she was a big advocate. And she says we want you to come and coach the women's basketball team for the rest of the season. So I left the ski group, which I wasn't uh, teaching anything anyhow, so I just came back and I went to Coleman Gym and the women's basketball team was in the, the uh, Coleman room with Rosemary McGee, with Dr. McGee in there. And I was out in the basketball, out in the gym shooting basketballs. And Rosemary McGee came out, Dr. McGee came out and said, Jim, we've got a problem. Says the girls don't want to play for you. They want to play for the assistant coach. They want the assistant coach to coach this basketball team. Says, would you come in the Coleman room with me? I said, sure. So Rosemary McGee is a really tough lady. And she's wonderful. She told those girls, she says, ladies, Coach Swiggett is a women's basketball coach. If you don't want to play for him, this season ends right now. Wow. And they decided to play. Do you remember who you beat in your first game as the coach on the road? Yes, I do. We played, uh, what was that school in Virginia, Tom? Uh, <laughs> I can't remember the name of the school, I just know who the coach was. Uh, Lynn A.G. was the basketball coach of the Virginia school and we played on the first road trip we went on. Yeah. And the basketball coach up there was Lynn A.G. And we went to Virginia and played them and we won that first game. And I was impressed with Lynn A.G.'s coaching and her uh, hospitality. And later on, when uh, the opening came to UNCG for women's basketball coach, I re recommended Ben A.G. to coach yeah. women's basketball at UNCG, and that's where she wound up. And they just say the rest is history. Now there's a gym named after her. <laughs> um. 
What else did you coach other than, so you coached men's basketball, um, women's basketball for a season. For one season, for a half a season. A half yes. a season. And then, um, so you. I coached you, a golf team. A golf team, okay. Yeah. And, and didn't one of your, uh, didn't you have some All-Americans on that team? Have what? Didn't you have some All-Americans on that team? Yeah, Joe, uh, I can't remember his Called name now. Caldera? Joe like Caldera. Yeah. Was a little All-American uh, on that uh, golf team. And I tell you, this, oh, I was mostly an organizer. I wasn't a coach. I wasn't smart enough or know enough about golf to take a swing down and put it back together. I organized everything, and uh, that the, we had play down, playoffs, and play downs for the spots on the team. So it was mostly due to the scores that they turned in and tryouts. Okay. Are there um were there any special awards that you received that you'd like to mention? I think I got a half. Uh, co-coach of the year one year. I can't remember. Yeah. I think it was a full coach of the year. I don't think it was any half to it. I think you were I coach of the year in Dixie Hopkins. <laughs> and you're in the Hall of Fame, aren't you? I was elected to the Hall of Fame at UNCG, yes. I'm quite proud of that. Wow. Okay. Well, and that was my next questioner. What, what, what are some of your proudest accomplishments um, during your time at UNCG? Well, I, coaching I, me. Coaching, <laughs> yeah, I, I really enjoyed coaching these young men who played basketball for the love of the game. They didn't receive any compensation except, like I said, some gym time, which we had some difficulties occasionally getting a gym enough, but we managed to fight for it and manage Dr. Uh, well, Miss Martis got us in the gym. She made sure we got gym time. And I'll tell you one interesting story that I don't know if you, about athletics at UNCG. I don't know if Tom even knows this or not. But one day, we got a call from the governor of North Carolina. He invited all athletic directors and all coaches. At that time, there were only five institutions in North Carolina that had athletic teams, five universities at that time. They weren't, that's all there were. And all their athletic directors and coaches were invited to a formal dinner at the governor's mansion. And Frank Pleasance, our athletic director, was, had received that invitation. And we decided to go and accept that invitation. We had to go rent tuxedos and our wives were invited. And we went to a sit-down dinner at the governor's <coughs> the Governor Dan Moore. And we were invited later to a the governor's mansion's private quarters where they served alcohol, they served drinks. They said, we can't serve any alcohol on government property. So the only place we can serve you a drink would be in the governor's mansion's uh, living quarters. And then we had to sit down dinner and, and we learned that the, all the servers were prisoners, lifers, lifetime prisoners. And we had that meal, and the servers were the, were the prisoners of the state of North Carolina. And that was one of the most interesting trips that I have ever made. Wow. Was that the first time you'd met Dean Smith? You know, Dean Smith didn't show up. Oh, he didn't? About, we were, there were, weren't more than a half a dozen or a, a, <laughs> the only people that showed, NC State had some people there, and I think NC Charlotte had some people there, and we had some people there, and the rest of them didn't even show up for that. I was kind of disappointed. No, who's Dean Smith? 
Uh, he is the premier coach at Carolina. Oh, okay. The Smith Center, the basketball oh. they play basketball is named for him. He's okay. Yeah, I remember he's probably him. one of the. I, most people say he's the best coach. He's one of the top three coaches of all times in the yeah. history of basketball. Oh, okay. Well, um, when did you retire from UNCG? When did I retire? Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. 1989. 19 what? 89. 19, you're right, 1989. Okay. Who took over when you left? You know, I don't even remember. Oh, Do you remember, Tom? No, I don't. I, I remember speaking at your retirement party, but I don't remember who might be in that book. Yeah, I, don't, have to, I don't remember. Yeah, it is. yeah. Well, that's okay. Maybe I'll add, I also would like to know, you were talking about Frank Pleasance and how he was the athletic right. director. Well, so when did he leave and who took over his position? This man. Frank was there after I believe he was there even after I left. No, no, huh? you were No, Frank left. Frank was there for eight years or something like that, and then you became athletic coordinator after he left. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, a lot of this I don't even remember. Yeah, you did. You just, I guess I did, didn't I? You did. Okay. You but, took that for, I don't know how many years, but you did that. I think you did that and stopped, that's when you stopped then, coaching. Yeah, mm -hmm. when they changed uh, directors of the Health, Physical Education and yeah. Recreation Department, uh, a lady came in from Ohio who uh, brought her number one man with her, and he was then named the physical uh, athletic coordinator, okay. Tony Ladd. Oh, Tony. Oh, that's... God, I forgot that, Tony. Oh, I forgot that. Oh. Okay. I, never mind. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we've had some ups and downs, but yeah, we have never, yeah. never serious conflicts. I don't think. Well, I think I'd like to ask you what UNCG means to you, and how has it impacted and affected your life? Well, actually, it became my life. You can't take over the job that I did at UNCG and not live, live it. I remember a lot of things that happened. A lot of people don't know a lot of everything that happened there, and I can't remember a lot of it. But one of the things that sticks out in my mind was in 1974, when the uh, national championship was being played in Greensboro. UCLA called North Carolina to find a place to practice. And UCLA showed up at Coleman Gym in a bus with John Wooden and their big center, Luke, what's his name? Lou was that Lou Alcindor? Was that his days? No, it wasn't Alcindor, it was after that. Uh, Walton? Yeah, Bill Walton. Yeah. Bill Walton, Bill Walton. Oh, Bill Walton. All right. They showed up in the out in the Rosen, I mean, at Coleman Gym parking lot, expecting to practice in Coleman Gym, and they thought they were in Chapel Hill. <laughs> they thought they were at Carolina, right? <laughs> they thought they were at Carolina. So I met them, Coach uh, Wooden. I said, "We can, we can allow you a practice here." I, I just took it on myself to allow them to practice in Coleman Gym, and I had some players uh, that were available to me, and I put them on guard at every door, and closed the gym down. And I opened the locker room to UCLA and John Wooden, and I was I met with all the players and all the, and the coaches. And I was well, watched their workouts, and I thought, well, this is just the like same, same basketball we play here at UNCG. Except the athletes are a little better, so. Uh, yeah. Actually, it didn't look all that much better. You know, <laughs> when you're doing layups and well, most true. of the practices, that's it's true. not much difference in you're how right. you look and so you're forth. Right. But anyhow, they were very gracious, and, and I enjoyed my meeting all those people. 
and we had students at UNCG that found out that UCLA was on campus, and they climbed up on top of Coleman Gym and were leaning down and looking in the windows upside down to watch the practices. <laughs> I've forgotten all about that. <laughs> So you've had some fun times at I'll UNCG. Tell you what, it, yeah. it's, it has been a, a life of high expectations and wonderful experiences with a lot of great people in UNCG and throughout the state of North Carolina. And I'm sure you witnessed a lot of changes um, in in the. Um, for the men's basketball team and the uh, the programs as well. Yes. A lot of changes. There have been a lot of changes, but not as much as you might think. I, it's really interesting. I, I see, I'm almost ashamed to tell you this, but I think when I quit coaching and uh, turned the reins over and uh, of the athletic association to somebody else, I've forgotten who it was now, Tony Leia, that's who it was. I don't think I hardly ever went to a basketball game again. <laughs> I had enough. <laughs> yeah, I think you came back to one game. I think we played Georgia Tech, and I got you to come here and sit with me for that game. I may I have. think I think I remember us. That's, that's the only game I remember you coming to, because I know if you'd been there, I would have been sitting with you. So. Yeah. But it has been a wonderful ride. The experience that I've had at UNCG and trying to get all the scheduling and players and doing all the paperwork is just, I can't believe it, I couldn't believe it really happened to me. But I was very grateful for all of it. And we were grateful to have you. So. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, my last question for you, I, I'm not sure uh, how relevant it will be because you said you, you haven't really been involved with UNCG that much since you retired. Not really. Uh, see, I lived in uh, Cedar Square, and the travel uh, had gotten to me. And everything was different. I, you know, when you're when you act, act, when you're involved in everything, it's different from when you're not involved anymore. And if you try to stay involved, sometimes you're accused of meddling. And I was not a meddler, <laughs> <laughs> so I just I backed off, and <coughs> enjoyed my life that I had left. And I have enjoyed that. I, when I graduated, they had a going away party for me, which was great. And since that time, I have been involved as a collector. Okay. You can tell by all the junk in this house that I collected a bunch of stuff. But I have enjoyed that almost as much or maybe more than I did coaching. Well, I, said, I know you've collected a lot of newspaper clippings. Someone saved all of the n newspaper clippings about the um, the men's basketball team. My mother yeah. and my daughter, but especially my mother, collected every clipping that ever came of every game that I, I was her first son. And I had a sister following me and a brother following her, and mother collected clippings for all of us, I'm sure. But that scrapbook, wherever it is, is full of the clippings that she collected. Right. And I tell you, she was just amazing. She, she didn't miss a clipping, I don't believe, did she, Ann? No. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, uh, hold it up to the... The camera, because it's quite a, yeah. quite a big book. Yes. This and the, very nice. Also another stack on the table, and the, and there are the folders from high school and yeah. other times too. So, but 
Hmm. Well, um, so uh, as you know, we're doing this um, this interview as part of the um, 125th anniversary of the university uh, in celebration of that. I know, um, man, I wasn't sure what it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I thought we told you. <laughs> Thank you for your <laughs> Okay. Well, so, you know, it's, it's a good time for reflection, of course, right. but it's, it's also a time to think about maybe where we're heading in the future. And so just, um, I just wanted to ask you, what do you think the future is for UNCG and where do you see the institution going um, in 25, 50 years? Well, I can see where it has gone in the last... 20 years or 30 years, uh, it has really changed since I got out of athletics. When they started giving athletic scholarships and grants is when a major change occurred and we had a lot of controversy about that in the beginning. Uh, a lot of people didn't, never wanted to, we wanted to keep it amateur situation and not uh, add scholarships and so forth, but it came. And uh, I have had lunch, and um, Tom and I had lunch last fall with uh, our current coach, mm -hmm. whom I met, and I was impressed with him and by him, and uh, I support him wholeheartedly. And uh, I have been to very few basketball games anywhere since then. But I, I watched um, television some, but I uh, really, uh, I don't know why to describe this, but my interest has just changed. Well, I don't think I have any more formal questions for you, but um, was there anything that we perhaps left out, anything that you would like to mention that we didn't get to touch on? Before. Uh, well, I thought of something a moment ago, and now I've forgotten it. Oh, no. Uh, the, Tom, can you think of anything that... Uh, I think we've talked about just about everything. I, I, think, mean, I so. think we've covered the pretty well the history of what happened when you got there, before you got there, and so... Yeah, I was a... Uh, I was right in the middle of everything. I was, and I was excited about it, and I loved doing it, and I'm proud to have been a part of it. More happy that you were. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for um, for agreeing to to do this interview. Thank you so much for all of your responses, and you as well, Tom. Thank you. Glad to do it again. Yeah. We appreciate you very much. Were you a student advisor also? Me? No. Well, no, I, I, turned, I turned to, uh, when I gave up sports and athletics, I, I was doing some part-time work in the advisor's office, and so I started working in there in the summers and part of the time. For the, SOAR? What, was it called SOAR back then? Okay. I don't know what it was Well, it was a... Uh, um, Academic Advisor's Office. Okay, yeah, that's, okay. That's yeah, I went that's... to work for them, and I enjoyed that work. I forgot you did that. Yeah. 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 So you were helping students sign up for classes and stuff? Yes. Okay. I was doing at, uh, what they call a student... Uh, when you checked, you checked out every student's record. And made sure everything was accurate on that record sheet, and I was doing a lot of that. Yeah. And then the registrar said. Hmm. 